Chapter 23 No man can be a success who is not governed by love, the Jesus kind of love. Faith, love, and wisdom are born of the recreated human spirit. When the human spirit becomes a partaker of the nature of God, you can see the limitlessness of it. If it were developed, it would make this recreated man a superman. It links him up with omnipotence. Mark 16, 17, and 18 And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These words, filled with faith, born of your spirit, now are spoken with your lips. And the same kind of results follow that Jesus promised. God-filled words, faith-filled words, but words spoken by common human lips produce miracles. Some Characteristics of the Superman Man was not created for slavery or bondage. To be weak is to be a slave. To be in want is to be in bondage. God's first man was what we would call a superman, a man who lived in the supernatural realm, not necessarily all the time, but whenever supernatural ability was necessary, he could draw on it. The Old Covenant began with the superman Abraham. At ninety-nine years of age, Abraham had his youth renewed, and Sarah had her youth renewed at ninety years of age. In every generation of Israel's history, as far as we know, there were men who at times entered into the supernatural realm, men who dared to obey the voice of an angel. In the deliverance of Israel, Moses exercised supernatural gifts, the opening of the Red Sea, the mighty miracles in the desert, and perhaps the greatest miracle was that when Moses died at the age of 120 years, his natural forces were not abated. He did not die of disease. He had finished his work, and Jehovah took him. Joshua was a supernatural man at times. His crossing of the Jordan, the fall of the walls of Jericho, the sun standing still, all these were acts of faith transcending the natural. Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, and the three Hebrew children all were supermen. They were common men in exterior. They lived as common men until some great demand was made upon them. Then they rose to the lofty height of faith that dominated circumstances and people around them. Jesus was a superman. From his baptism until his resurrection, he lived above natural laws. He ruled them at his will. He walked upon the sea. He hushed the storms and the winds. He controlled the fish at will. He fed the multitude with five loaves and two little fish. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He caused maimed limbs to become whole once more. He was the absolute master of all the laws of nature. Perhaps the most staggering miracle of his ministry was the raising of Lazarus, whose body had begun to decay. For four days that body had been in the tomb, and Jesus, as simply as I would ask you to pass me a book, said, Lazarus, come forth. He was the absolute master of death. The most significant thing about the ministry of Jesus from this angle was what he said about those who were to believe on him. Matthew 19, 26, With God all things are possible. Here the God of all flesh, with whom all things are possible, is brought into contact with humanity in the person of Jesus. This all-powerful God is the one with whom we deal. John 17, 2, Even as thou gavest him authority over all flesh, that to all whom thou hast given him he should give eternal life, Jesus had authority over all flesh. Jesus and the Father were one in their mighty purpose in ministry. In Matthew 17, 21, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples, he said, And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Jesus was either speaking carelessly, or he was declaring a great truth. We believe he spoke a great truth. Something was going to happen to them that was going to bring them into the class with God. All things are possible with God and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Mark 9.23 All things are possible to him that believeth. That word believeth is the same word that we get in Mark 16.17 And these signs shall accompany them that believe. It really means a believing one. 
one who has accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, who has been recreated, come into the family of God, and these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Jesus promised that in his name the disciples should be supermen. There is no escaping this. No matter what the churches teach today, here is the fact. Nineteenth verse. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken unto them, was received up into heaven, and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Some will tell you that the day of miracles is past. It is past to the largest part of the sense knowledge ruled church, but it is not past to anyone who believes the word and dares to do the things that Jesus has commanded us to do in his word. Here we see the utter limitlessness of John 14, 12 through 14. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If he shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. Jesus is not talking about prayer. He is talking about the thing he mentions in Mark 16. In my name ye shall cast out demons. He says, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. Peter, standing at the beautiful gate, when the crippled man held out his hands for help, said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have, that I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. The man was perfectly healed. It was faith in that name that made him well. The name of Jesus in the lips of an uneducated man like Peter made that man whole. He was greater than disease. He had the authority over disease. He had the ability to change that helpless man whose legs had never sustained his body, so they became normal, so that the man ran, leaping and praising God, into the temple. He had performed a prodigy. He had made that cripple a new man. That ability has never been withdrawn from the church. It belongs to the church now, in the name of Jesus. John 15:16, That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. John 16, 23 and 24. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if ye shall ask anything of the Father, he will give it you in my name. If language means anything, this means that there is limitless ability in the name of Jesus, and that limitless ability is given to the man who believes in Jesus Christ. All it requires is that we act on that name that we honor God enough to acknowledge the truthfulness of what Jesus said. Matthew 18, 19-20 If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is another promise of supernatural ability. It is given to two. If one fails and has an ability to take the thing alone, he can get someone else to join with him. One shall face a thousand, and two shall put ten thousand to flight, is the promise that was given to the old covenant people. In the new covenant, there are limitless privileges given to the individual believer that were utterly unknown to those of the old covenant. What is necessary in order for us to enjoy the abilities of this supernatural life? I want to call to your attention several things. They are the same abilities that mark and characterize the ordinary child of God today, because he never uses them does not bring discredit upon his privileges. First, we must be free from Satan's dominion. There is no ground for faith as long as one is conscious of slavery. Faith can only grow in the realm of freedom. The first thing that Jesus had to do to lay the foundation for a supernatural life was to conquer Satan. Jesus identified himself with the human race in order that we, by accepting his great substitutionary work, might be identified with his deliverance. He became a man, that as a man he might conquer Satan. Then he permitted himself to be nailed to the cross, and God laid our sin nature, 
our weakness, our bondage, our fear, yes, laid us upon him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Him who knew no sin, God made to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. No man can enjoy the righteousness of God who is in bondage. The very thought of righteousness means deliverance. It means that Satan's dominion has been annulled, abolished, and destroyed. In the great revelation of Jesus that Paul gives us in his epistles, he shows us that when Christ was nailed to that cross, we were identified with him. It was for us that he was nailed there. We were crucified with him. We died with him. We were buried with him. We actually went to the place of suffering with him. He was our substitute. He was taking our place. It was as though we were there. His suffering was our suffering. Then, after he had paid the penalty of our transgressions and made provision for our justification, he was justified, declared righteous. When he was justified and declared righteous, it was our emancipation. He was recreated, made alive in spirit. That was when we were made alive in spirit and became new creations in the mind of justice. Before he was raised from the dead, he met Satan in his own throne room, stripped him of the authority that Adam had given to him in the garden. The victory that Jesus celebrated over the adversary when he put off from himself the principalities and the powers was our victory. If Jesus conquered the devil, you conquered the devil. It was your victory, not his. He had no reason to fight that battle. When Jesus conquered Satan and stripped him of his authority, he arose from the dead and shouted to the disciples, All hail! Redemption morn had come to the human. The instant you take Jesus Christ as your Savior and confess him as your Lord, everything that Jesus wrought in those days and nights of suffering and of triumph and victory belongs to you. Then this fact stands out clearly. We are absolutely delivered from the dominion of Satan. As far as we are concerned, Satan has been dethroned. His dominion has been broken. 1 Corinthians 2.6, one translation reads, The dethroned powers of this age. That is a very remarkable expression. They were the ones who crucified our Lord. He dethroned them. Let this become absolutely clear, workable knowledge in your mind. You have been delivered from Satan's dominion. Satan has no right to reign over you. A second great fact, I must be able to stand in God's presence, free from condemnation, without fear, without the sense of guilt or inferiority. As long as there is a sense of condemnation, there will be no sense of freedom. There will be no place for faith to develop. The moment a man knows that he has a legal right to stand in the Father's presence, just as freely as Jesus, that moment Satan's dominion over him ends. Then Colossians 1, 13 and 14 becomes a reality, who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have our redemption, the remission of our sins. The instant you know that you have become the righteousness of God in Him, that moment Satan's dominion over you ends. It is this sense of guilt and sin that robs man of his initiative, robs him of his ability to stand uncondemned in God's presence. If one is condemned in God's presence, he stands condemned and belittled in the presence of sickness, disease, and poverty. He is whipped by them. But if he knows that on the ground of the finished work of Christ, he can become a new creation, created in Christ Jesus, and the moment he accepts Jesus Christ, God gives to him his own nature, and he becomes the righteousness of God in Christ, and receives eternal life. Then it is not a problem of feeling or sense knowledge, but a problem of the absolute accuracy and truthfulness of the Word of God. He knows that he is what God says he is, the righteousness of God in Christ. He is not afraid to walk into the Father's presence. He is not afraid of disease and sickness, of poverty and want. He knows that he is a master. A third fact, he must become a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. I have shown you that there is a redemption and a righteousness provided. That redemption and righteousness become realities when he becomes a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18 Wherefore, 
If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all these things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. That new creation is a son of God. 1 John 3, 2 Beloved, now are we the children of God. That new creation is an heir of God, and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That new creation has received eternal life. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, even unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. When one receives eternal life, the nature of God, he becomes a member of the body of Christ. He utterly becomes one with Christ, so that John 15, 1-8, becomes a reality in his mind. I am the vine, ye are the branches. That believing one is a member of the body of Christ. He is just as near Christ as the branches to the vine. He is just as much a part of God as Jesus was a part of God. Just as much a part of God as the branch is a part of the vine. You are tied up with the ability of God. You are tied up with omnipotence. God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. God's mind is above ours. In Paul's revelation, he says, We have the mind of Christ. This new creation is really in the realm of God. The new creation recognizes only one Lord, Jesus Christ. The new creation has a legal right to all the privileges that were wrought in Christ for man. Everything that Jesus did and all that Jesus is today belongs to the new creation because the new creation is a part of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12, we are called the Christ, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of the body being many are one body, so also is Christ. In 2 Corinthians 6.15, the church is called the Christ, and what conquered hath Christ with Belial. The unregenerate man is called Belial. The recreated man is called Christ. I am the vine, ye are the branches. The branch is a part of the vine. A fourth fact, this new creation must know his legal rights and standing in Christ. The Bible is made up of two legal documents, an old and a new covenant. A covenant is a contract an agreement. The first contract was between Abraham and God. The second contract was between Christ and the body of Christ, the church and God. Jesus' death was a legal death. Substitution was a legal act. The demands of justice had to be met. Jesus met the demands of justice. The Supreme Court of the universe accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as having met the demands of justice against any man would take Jesus Christ as Savior and accept His Lordship over His life. This legally born child of God has a legal right to use the name of Jesus. He has a legal right to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He has a legal right to His place in the family of God and to His share of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has a legal right to the ability of God. All that Jesus was and is legally belongs to the believer. All that Jesus did and is doing now belongs to the child of God legally. The child of God has a legal right to the Father's protection and care. He has a legal right to food, raiment, and a home. He has a legal right to fellowship and happiness with the brethren. He has a legal right to reign over Satan and demons, to reign over poverty. Romans 5.17, Weymouth, For if through the transgression of the one individual Death made use of the one individual to seize the sovereignty. That is spiritual death. Satan seized the supremacy over the human race, seized the sovereignty that Adam had in the garden. Adam had dominion over all the works of God's hands. Satan took that away from man. Jesus came and restored that dominion to man. All the more shall those who receive God's overflowing grace and gift of righteousness reign as kings in life through the one individual, Jesus Christ. How much grace have we received? Jesus was God's grace. Grace is love in action, blessing the human race. Great grace was upon the disciples. 
great divine acts in healing the sick, in performing miracles. We have received the abundance of His ability to help humanity. We have received the gift of righteousness, the ability to stand in the Father's presence without the sense of inferiority or fear, the ability to stand in the presence of Satan as a master, to stand in the presence of disease and sickness as a deliverer. We have received that abundance of grace and this gift of righteousness. What is the result? We reign as kings in the realm of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It has made masters of us. We who have been slaves have now become the rulers. Common people are entering into the throne room and joining forces with King Emmanuel. We are dealing with the actual things that belong to the Christian, but have been ignored by the church. Today, any man who confesses these things is considered to be a fanatic. Jesus died as a fanatic. Paul died as a fanatic. John and Peter and all the rest of the apostles died as fanatics. People said Paul turned the world upside down. This message will turn the world upside down if men will believe it and act upon it. The Holy Spirit is ours. As soon as you are born again, your body is the home of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 or know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have from God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your body. Glorify Him now, by laying hands on the sick, by letting your tongue become the pulpit of God, through which He will speak His mighty words. The words that I speak, they are spirit, and they are life, said Jesus. The word becomes spirit, and life in the man who has yielded to the Lordship of Jesus, and in whom the Spirit has absolute sway and rule. This is a marvelous fact of grace, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work within you, willing and working his own good pleasure. Literal translation. You have become the throne room of God, so to speak. Your body has become the pulpit out of which this inside God is ruling. Oh, that the church might become God-inside-minded. They are weakness-minded. They are sickness-minded. They are inferiority-complex-minded. They are trouble and poverty-minded, but they are not God-minded. If you become God-minded, then the mind of Christ will become yours. God will think through your mind and speak through your lips. God will heal the sick with your words and the touch of your hands. You will pass out of the realm of the inferior into the realm of the supernatural. 1 John 4.4 4, Ye are of God, I am of God. If I am of God, you may expect me to act like God, to speak like God. You may expect me to dominate and rule demons as God did. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in the world opposing God? Satan is, through men and women. It is not the men and women who are opposing God. It is the demon power that has gained the ascendancy over their minds. We are going to dethrone him. Jesus dethroned him, and he knows it. But he is still holding on to these world-minded men. How are we going to dethrone him? The truth is going to set men free. We are going to unveil the word, so simply, so clearly, and the power of God is going to be so mightily upon it that men and women are going to get their deliverance. Supernatural men will be dressed as common men, but they will have the ability, the strength, and the wisdom of God in them. A fifth characteristic of the superman is that they will love men. They are begotten of love. God is love. They have received God's nature. They are lovers. They are no longer seeking their own. They live and work as Jesus did. No matter what their daily tasks, no matter what their station in life may be, these men, who are the sons of God, are going to love as He would love. They are not seeking their own. They count not the things that are theirs to be theirs. They act as trustees of them. Jesus is unveiled to the heart of man through the lives of these men. It is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Do you think that the lover, Jesus, would live in a man, and that that man could be selfish and bitter? The superman is going to be a lover. The most outstanding feature of the superman is love. It is the Jesus kind of love. It is agape, set on fire by grace, that is reaching through men's lips and men's acts after lost men. He is not only the super lover, 
but he is the Son of God. And God is not only a love God, but he is also a faith God. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is giving substance to things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. Faith is giving substance to a thing that has never been real as yet. As long as you hope for it, it is not real. You never hope when you have reality. Hope is always in the future. Faith is now. Faith is changing the base metal into the purest gold. Third verse. By faith, we understand that the worlds have been framed by the word of God, so that what is seen hath not been made out of things which appear. The universe was brought into being by the word of God. That agrees with John 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Turn back to Genesis 1, and notice all God said was, Let there be, and things came into being. A universe came into being by the word of God. The vegetable world came into being. The animal world came into being by his word. We are the sons of a faith God. Our words are to be faith words. We are to take his words, as Peter did, when he said to the man at the gate of the temple, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He was taking the words from the lips of the Master. You bring health and strength where weakness has held control. You bring success where failure has dominated. You bring plenty where poverty has run riot. The days of poverty and weakness are over. We have the strength of God. Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. The end of want has arrived because we know how to change the baser metals into the purest in Jesus Christ. This new creation must learn the secret and joy and blessing of using the name of Jesus, as you would use a wrench to tighten a nut on a bolt, as you would use a knife to cut a piece of meat. You dare to use the name of Jesus to bring healing and deliverance. You dare to step out of the realm of the senses into the realm of the Spirit, and begin to act as the sons and daughters of God Almighty should act. Chapter 24 Can there be any impossibilities to us in Christ? You remember that Jesus said, All things are possible to him that believeth. He walked in the spirit realm, and that is our realm today. What a challenge this is to the believer. The Greek word believeth means a believing one. There never were any believing ones until the family of God came into being on the day of Pentecost. So everyone that comes into the family is called a believing one. Jesus, in that declarative statement, has issued a challenge to us, a challenge for us to live in the realm of the Spirit, or, in other words, to live in the realm of miracles. Now notice a few facts. We have God's nature, eternal life, that puts us into God's class of being. We have become, by a new creation, the very sons of God. When he says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, we know that it is no metaphysical statement, but a statement of fact. Romans 4.13 tells us that Jesus is the heir of the world. No one knows the limits of the possibilities of the sons of God. We not only have God's nature in us, but the great mighty Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead has made his home in us and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That he that is in the world is Satan. The he that is in us is God. We have limitless possibilities. The church has been governed by sense-knowledge philosophy. They have a philosophical redemption, a philosophical new birth, a philosophical relationship with God as Father. Only a few men have come into the realization of the realities of these mighty spiritual forces. Let it be understood that spiritual forces are greater than physical. A spirit-created material substance such as the world, with all its minerals, metals, and chemicals, this was brought into being by God, and God is a spirit. Satan is also a spirit. He is the author of all the confusion, sin, wars, hatreds, jealousies, and every other wicked thing. God is greater than Satan, and he has imparted to man in the new birth his own nature. Jesus said a phenomenal thing when he gave the Great Commission as recorded in Mark 16:17. 17. 
In my name ye shall cast out demons. He lays down a law, and by this law the believer is greater than demons, because he can cast them out. If he can cast out demons, then he is master of Satan. If he is master of Satan, then he is master of any of the works of Satan. Satan is the author of sickness, the author of wars, and all the unhappiness and misery in this old world. If the word means anything to us, then we are masters of the circumstances and the forces that are governing the world today. The church has not recognized it. The church has been dabbling with unbelief. It has been praying for faith, the most absurd thing for which man ever prayed. But, you say, the disciples said, O Lord, increase our faith. Yes, but they were Jews under the first covenant with unregenerated spirits. You cannot find any such folly as that in the Pauline Revelation. He calls his revelation the word of faith, and it is the word of faith. It is the word that produces faith, that gives birth to faith. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When you need a thing, you do not have to ask for faith to accept it, do you? Well, if you knew the word of God was absolutely safe and reliable and could be acted upon as the word of a bank or any other large corporation, prayer would be a different thing, wouldn't it? If you knew that no word from God was void of power, if you knew that Isaiah 55:11, which reads, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it, could be utterly depended upon that no word from God is void of fulfillment, that he watches over his word to make it good, that the eternal throne is founded upon his word, and Jesus is declared to be the surety of the new covenant, and that Jesus is the surety of every word from Matthew to Revelation, and his throne is back of it, and his integrity is enwrapped in it, if this were real to you, then you would have no faith problem. The Word of God is a part of God Himself. In John 14, 13 and 14, Jesus said, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. You know that the word ask here means demand. It is just as though Jesus said, Whatsoever you demand in my name, I will make good. That is not prayer. When Jesus talks about prayer, we have it recorded in John 16, 23. And in that day ye shall not pray to me, but verily, verily, I say unto you, if ye shall ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. That is prayer. You are to go to the Father in that name. Jesus has told us that whatsoever you ask of the Father in that name, the Father will give you. The other scripture has reference to demanding demoniacal forces broken over men's lives, like Paul casting the spirit of divination out of the woman which is recorded in the 16th chapter of Acts, or Peter in John saying to the man at the beautiful gate, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. They performed so many miracles in that name that the Sanhedrin arrested them and commanded them not to preach or teach in that name. That name was the mightiest force in the entire country at that time, and that name has lost none of its power or authority. He has given us, the believing ones, the power of attorney to use it. In that name we may cast out demons, heal the sick, break Satan's dominion over men's lives. We have another mighty weapon called the Sword of the Spirit, the Living Word. That word in our lips saves lost men, brings courage and victory where defeat has reigned as a king, produces faith in the faithless, hope in the hopeless, gives courage and mastery to broken-hearted men. That word in our lips has creative energy and power. It is not a problem of faith. It is a problem of our acting fearlessly and intelligently on what God has spoken. Before Jesus went away, he said to the disciples, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be clothed with power from on high. Acts 1.8 But ye shall receive power 
when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. The Greek word translated power there means ability. Now note, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you receive ability from on high. That will be God's ability. You are to have God's ability in you, God's ability to speak, to use the name of Jesus, God's ability to understand the Scriptures, God's ability to do His will, His ability to face the world with fearless confidence, also to suffer any kind of persecution without yielding a particle. God took uneducated fishermen and gave them His ability, His wisdom. They had the knowledge of their earth walk with Jesus. They had knowledge of His actual death and resurrection. They had knowledge of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now He becomes their wisdom to use that knowledge and how they used it how they shook the very foundations of the Roman government and the Jewish nation. They had God's ability. They had God's life that flowed out of God's nature, which was imparted to them. They had ability to walk in love, to walk in the Word. What mighty men the ability of God made out of common, uneducated fishermen. Colossians 1.13 Who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have our redemption, the remission of our sins. Reality of Redemption Our redemption was a reality. God's Son became incarnate, went on the cross, went down into hell as our substitute. When He had satisfied the claims of justice against the human race, He was justified because He had wrought the thing for which He was sent. He was made alive in spirit, actually recreated. God said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. That was not his birth through Mary. That was his birth out of spiritual death, out of satanic dominion down in the dark regions of the lost. There he was justified, was made alive in spirit. There he put off from himself the principalities and powers, and he conquered the forces of hell, absolutely defeating them, he left Satan and his cohorts absolutely defeated, stripped them of their authority, and then he arose from the dead. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. When he arose from the dead, he was master of Satan and of all hell. He had redeemed us out of the hand of the enemy. Now you can understand that we are delivered out of the authority of darkness. Satan is darkness. Jesus is the light of life. We were not only redeemed out of darkness, but we were translated by the new birth into the kingdom of the Son of His love. It is in this Son of His love that we have our perfect redemption. In the mind of the Father, you are as perfectly redeemed from the hand of Satan as Jesus was when He arose from the dead. In Ephesians 1, 7-23, you catch a glimpse of the utter reality of this redemption, in whom we have our redemption through His blood, the remission of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. The redemption is according to the riches of His grace. The believer is just as really redeemed from the hand of the enemy as Israel was from the authority of and dominion of Egypt when they crossed the Red Sea. Satan has no dominion over our finances unless we permit it. He has no dominion over our physical bodies unless we permit it. He has no dominion over our spirits to keep us in bondage and give us the sense of inferiority and unworthiness because we have been made new creations in Christ Jesus and have become the righteousness of God in Christ. When we know the truth, then the truth sets us free. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. His feet means the church, for we are his body, and he is the head of that body. He put all things in subjection under the church, which is his body. The church is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 
no one knows what the church really means to the heart of the Father. No one knows what it means to Christ. He gave his own life for it. The Father gave his own Son for it. It was not his purpose that the church should be a bunch of weaklings over whom the devil could reign and dominate. No, the body has the same authority that Jesus had in his earth walk. The body of Christ individually have the same ability as far as dealing with sickness and disease and the works of the devil that Jesus had in his earth walk. Satan's dominion is broken. It is the new era of freedom for man. John 8.36 has become a glorious reality. If therefore the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If the Son shall set you free, you are free in reality, and the Son has set us free. What are we going to do with our freedom? We want to be sure of one thing, that we have not received the grace of God in vain, that we are taking advantage of our rights and privileges in Christ. Do you understand Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus? Justified means declared righteous, made righteous, being therefore made righteous by His grace through this marvelous redemption that is wrought in Christ Jesus. It is a limitless thing. Now, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21. Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new, and all these things are of God. Or as Way translates it, and all of this, God is the source. He reconciled me to himself by the mediation of Messiah. He has assigned to me the office of this reconciliation. The charter whereof is God was present in the Messiah, reconciling to himself the world, canceling the record of their transgressions, and the message of this reconciliation he entrusted to me. I am acting, therefore, as Messiah's ambassador. It is as though God were pleading with you by my mouth. As Messiah's representative, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Jesus knew not sin, yet God made him to be the world sin with our sins, that we whose sin he had thus assumed might become by our union with him the very righteousness of God. Notice the ring of reality in this whole translation of verses 18 through 21. God was present in the Messiah, reconciling to himself the world canceling or wiping out the record of their transgressions. What a declarative statement. When you become a new creation, there is nothing in the books against you. It has all been wiped out. The message of this reconciliation he has entrusted to you and to me. We are acting, therefore, as the ambassadors of heaven. Now, I want you to notice what this new creation is. It was created in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Did you notice that we are His workmanship? Just as much as Adam was His workmanship. We are actually born of the Spirit. We are actually partakers of the very nature and substance of God. We have become the very righteousness of God in Him. Read Way's translation once more. Jesus knew not sin, Yet God made him to be the world's sin, for our sins that we, whose sin he had thus assumed, might become, by our union with him, the very righteousness of God in Christ. We had become the very righteousness of God. The thing that has held us in bondage all of our lives has been sin consciousness, the sense of unworthiness. Our ministers have preached sin instead of righteousness. Whenever they mention righteousness, they carry the thought of our being right and doing right rather than our being made by the new creation the very righteousness of God and that there is no longer any sin consciousness to disturb us and keep us in bondage to the adversary. 1 Peter 1.23 Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God which liveth and abideth. What we are in Christ. Now we get this thing clearly. We have the same eternal life that Jesus had. For Jesus declares, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. 
We have the vine life in us. We have the substance in us that was in Jesus. Jesus has become our redemption and our wisdom. Jesus now becomes the ability of God in us so that we are wiser than the adversary. The next great fact is that we have God in us. John 14, 16, and 17 And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. For it beholdeth him not, neither knoweth him. Ye know him, for he abideth with you, and shall be in you. John 16, 13, and 14 Howbeit, when he the Spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak from himself, but what things soever he shall hear, these shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine, and shall declare it unto you. Notice the Spirit is to glorify Jesus in us, for he is going to take the things of Jesus and build them into us. He is going to be our teacher, but he's going to be more than the word teacher actually means. He is going to be an imparter of the very nature of the Father. He is going to build into us the nature and characteristics of Christ. The Father is love. He is going to build love into us until all our actions and words will be love-colored and love-filled. Then he is going to be wisdom to us. The wisdom of the Father is unveiled in the Word. He is going to build wisdom into us so that we will be able to act wisely in every circumstance. We are going to be like Jesus. We are going to have His ability and wisdom, and we will rest quietly in Him. We will have His confidence in the Father. It will no longer be a problem of faith. It will simply be a problem of recognizing the Father's will. We will know that we have the ability to do it. How big that will make life. How real it will make it. The old struggle to get faith and to be good will be a thing of the past. All this is wrought in the recreated human spirit, the hidden man of the heart. We will be able to live and walk with the Master. He is going to open the Word to us until it will become a living reality. It will not be just a book. It will be a living thing, living and active in every phase of our daily life. 1 John 4.4 4 will become a conscious reality to us. This will be real. Ye are of God, my little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When we awaken in the morning, we will remember, I will conquer today, for I have his wisdom, I have his ability, I have the great mighty spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwelling in me. He will enable me to use the wisdom that is mine. When I act on the word, I will do it with a sureness like a sureness that was in Jesus' earth walk. There was no hesitancy there. He knew. So now today, I will know, because all this day, the one who raised Jesus from the dead is going to be a motive force in my life. He is going to keep me quiet in hard places. He is going to give me grace, or in other words, he will teach me how to enjoy the fullness of grace, the fullness of love, and the fullness of joy that are mine. Can you imagine any limitations or impossibilities to the believer who enjoys what I have already written? When you realize that we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had, the same mighty name that the apostles had, the same living word, can you not see the limitlessness of this divine life? All authority was given to Jesus in heaven and on earth, so that when we pray in that name, it moves heaven and it conquers anything on earth. That name reaches into heaven. It is known in heaven. A little while ago, an epileptic came to our services. He had had his disease for years, and he had one of those awful fits in our service. I took my rights in the name of Jesus. I cast that demon out. The man was completely healed, and it has never come back. He had been unable to work, just a burden to himself. Now he is healthy and vigorous and strong. That is the power authority and ability that is wrapped up in the name of Jesus. We have a legal right to use the name and to use the word. Our legal rights. We have a legal right to the ability that belongs to the body of Christ. I do not know whether or not you have ever realized what it means to you 
to have a legal right to use the word, to take your place as a son in the family of God, to exercise your rights. It will bring glory to the Father and joy to the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, The works that I do are my Father's works. The words that I speak are my Father's words. Then he said, The words that I speak unto you are spirit and are life. Now you use that word just as Jesus used the Father's words. You may fearlessly cast out demons in that name. The word declares, In my name ye shall cast out demons. You can fearlessly lay your hands on the sick and know that they will recover just as they did when Jesus touched them. Just as they did when the early church touched them. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the Word was God. That Word is Jesus in our lips. When you use the Word, you are using Jesus. When you speak His Word, you are speaking the very thing that Jesus would speak in your place. Fearlessly take your place. There is nothing impossible to him that believeth. You have come into the realm of miracles. Now dare to live there and enjoy your rights. This concludes the reading of E.W. Kenyon's The Hidden Man of the Heart. Thank you for listening.